Now we're going to look at the operators for angular momentum and their eigenvalues for the eigenfunctions of them, which are the spherical harmonics, our wave functions for the rigid rotor. So those wave functions are, as we saw, this very complicated normalization constant, i to the m plus absolute magnitude m, times the square root of 2j plus 1 over 4 pi times j minus absolute value of m factorial over j plus absolute value of m factorial times the associated Legendre function p of j absolute magnitude m and cosine theta is the variable which we put in there for x or whatever variable you see when you look it up in a table the variable of the polynomial is cosine theta and then that times a complex exponential, the oscillatory function, e to the i m phi. We have two quantum numbers, uh, j and m. Sometimes you might see j as l. j and l are the same thing. <clears throat> as a function of this theta and phi, the polar and azimuthal angle in spherical polar coordinates. So our Hamiltonian operator was just the kinetic energy operator. and our potential was zero, so thus our total Hamiltonian is just the kinetic energy operator. And kinetic energy can be written as momentum squared over two times mass, and it can also be written as angular momentum squared over two times moment of inertia, where moment of inertia is uh, the reduced mass times the bond length squared of some uh, chemical bond that we have of length L with two masses M1 and M2, their reduced mass. Okay, so looking back at the part of the Laplacian which depends on theta and phi, and it has no derivatives in R, we can assign a form to this L squared, this total angular momentum squared operator. And that is that L squared is going to equal minus h bar squared, because there's a minus h bar squared in here when you look at the total Hamiltonian and then times this big gaudy part of the Laplacian without the derivatives of r, which is 1 over sine theta partial with respect to theta. All of that inside of sine theta, another partial with respect to theta. So remember our order of operations. Take the derivative with respect to theta, then multiply times sine, then take the derivative again. And then this plus 1 over sine squared theta times second derivative with respect to phi. Okay, so this is the explicit form of the L squared operator. It's very gaudy and long. And if you wanted to actually calculate the eigenvalues of the spherical harmonics for this L squared operator, that would be quite an intensive algebraic thing to do, but you could do it and given enough time you would get the answers which we're about to discuss. So just to say in fully detail, this is the total angular momentum squared operator. Total angular momentum squared operator. So this will tell us what the square of the total angular momentum of our wave function is. And this can also be written, L squared, as a sum of the three directional components of angular momentum in the x, y, and z direction. Lx squared plus Ly squared plus Lz squared. So what of these, which of these functions is are the spherical harmonics eigenfunctions of? Are they, let's pick a different color there. So we're going to either put a check mark or an X if it is an eigenfunction of these operators. So is it an eigenfunction of L squared? Yes. Is it an eigenfunction of LX squared? It will not be. It will not be an eigenfunction of LY squared and it will be an eigenfunction of LZ squared, and it will also be an eigenfunction of LZ. So just the angular momentum in the Z, in the Z direction and not squared. So let's discuss uh, these, these components here and what they are as well, because we haven't looked at angular operators like this yet. So LX 
is just going to be the operator for y times pz minus z times py. These can be written as a as a cross product of a 3 by 3 matrix, but you'll very quickly see the pattern here. So it's going to be minus ih bar y partial with respect to z minus z partial with respect to y. And then to go to the next component, we just translate around kind of the circle there. We go to y goes to z, z goes to x, uh, x goes to y. So we get then z goes to x, pz, which is minus i h bar z partial with respect to x minus x partial with respect to z. <clears throat> Again, noticing that the minus i h bar has been factored out for the momentum. Then the one we're interested in, the operator is x py minus y px, which is minus i h bar x partial with respect to y, y partial with respect to x. But this is in Cartesian, and we've been dealing with spherical polar coordinates for this entire model system, so we want z in spherical polar coordinates. And if you do the transformation between uh, Cartesian and spherical polar, you'll see very conveniently that LZ just becomes minus i h bar d d phi. And that's nice because the only part where m or phi explicitly shows up in here is in this complex exponential and the derivative with it with respect to it is really simple we're just going to get an m to drop out so now that we've discussed what the explicit form of these operators are hopefully if you have some exam with these you at least are given a formula sheet which contains l squared l squared is very complicated and even i don't remember it offhand it's something i have to look up but if we take the operator L squared and we act on a spherical harmonic of say Lm or Jm, whichever you prefer, what you're going to get if you slug through all of that algebra is that you're going to get h bar squared times L, if I'm using L, times L plus 1, or J times J plus 1, times Y LM of theta and phi. So that's an eigenvalue equation. An operator times a function equals a constant times that function back. So the eigenvalues of L squared are H bar squared L times L plus 1. And you'll notice uh, this, if you were to divide it by 2 times I, uh, is actually the total energy for the uh, for the rigid rotor because this angular momentum squared divided by 2i is the total Hamiltonian and the total Hamiltonian that operator gives us the total energy so this is just a constant away from the total energy and then also if we look at LZ acting on y of LM function of theta and phi you're just going to get the simple result of h bar m times y l m theta and phi. So the eigenvalue of l z, the angular momentum component in the z direction, is just going to be h bar times m. So if m equals zero, the eigen the angular momentum in the z direction is zero. If m equals one, it's h, it's h bar. If m equals two, it's two h bar, etc. If you have L equals zero, then your total angular momentum is zero. If L equals one, or J equals one, your total angular momentum is going to be one times one plus one is two h bar squared. If it's three, it's gonna give you two times three, which is six h bar squared. Four, it's gonna give you 12 h bar squared, etc. So that's how you calculate what the angular momentum of a system is. Uh, for a rigid rotor, depending on what its quantum, uh, what its quantum numbers are, and you can see every state is going to have a distinct set of eigenvalues, because we have our possible values of j or l, which start at zero and go up from there, and within each value of j, each specific 
eigenfunction, each specific state with a different value of m is going to have a different eigenvalue of m. And whenever you have multiple different states, there has to be at least one eigenvalue which distinguishes it from all other states. So you can't have you can't have multiple states which have all of the exact same eigenvalues. We're going to need to see at least one eigenvalue which is different for uh, different quantum states. And that's going to be more important going forward looking at the hydrogen atom, which now is going to be in spherical polar coordinates, but in three dimensions. So it's not just going to have this theta and phi, but also r. So there's going to need to be three distinct quantum numbers for the different hydrogen atom states for them to be distinguishable.